Hi, I'm Lowell Joseph Gallen, and I am here with our guest for our interview, Eyal Boers. Eyal, shalom. Hanukkah Sameach. Tonight is the third night of Hanukkah. And we are here at Jerusalem Cinematheque for the premiere of Eyal's film, and Tebi. Live or die. Live or die. Yeah. On July 4th, 1976, the 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America, Israeli commandos raided the airport at Entebbe in Uganda, rescued captives held hostage there by Idi Amin, dictator at the time. Uh, one soldier died in that rescue, the brother of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Yonatan Netanyahu. Eyal, tell us about your film, please. Well, Live or Die in Tebi is a 52-minute documentary, and it actually follows the untold story of Operation in Tebi, the victims who were forgotten, so to speak. Um, it's actually Operation in Tebi as a personal tragedy of three families who lost their, um, their relatives in the operation, and amidst all the happiness and the joy of the hostages coming back on the 4th of July, people tended to forget that in such operations and in such events, hostages, uh, you know, hostages might lose their lives, and that's what happened. So, in one sentence, it would be Operation Entebbe as a personal family tragedy, specifically Jean-Jacques Mimouni, um, a Tunisian-French hostage, 19-year-old, um, Tunisian French hostage who made Aliyah to Israel a few years before the operation found himself um, found himself on the plane, found himself separated together with the Israeli Jews, and um, and killed during the operation itself. How does the hostage taking begin? Does it begin with a flight and route from one location to the other? where the flight is commandeered and then taken to Entebbe Airport? Well, the, uh, it turned out from my research that the passengers didn't even expect to have a layover in Athens. And this is the whole, this is where it all begins. After the flight takes off from Athens, the, um, uh, the hostage takers, the hijackers, two Germans and two Palestinians take over the plane. They landed in Benghazi, Libya to refuel and then they go to Entebbe, Uganda, approximately 4,000 kilometers from Israel. Everything was planned, everything was uh, as planned, and well, this is what happened. This is what happened. And Idi Amin knew that they were coming, and he was part of this conspiracy to hijack the plane. Well, not part of the conspiracy to hijack the plane, but part of the plan to host the plane knowing that no other country except Libya perhaps would be willing to host this plane. Idi Amin had a pretty good relationship with Israel in the beginning of the 70s. The um, terrorist groups who kidnapped the plane knew that Idi Amin's relationship with Israel was deteriorating and he was looking for an opportunity to take revenge, so to speak, against Israel. Idi Amin had been a paratrooper when he was younger who trained with the Israeli army, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. He was actually trained, one of the people who trained him as a paratrooper is the, was the deputy of Yoni Netanyahu during the operation. And it was his idea, the deputy, to use a Mercedes car to, um, to, to come undercover and to imitate Idi Amin's delegation. It was his plan to fool the Ugandan forces, knowing the people who came to Israel to train with the Israeli paratroopers. So, it's interesting to, to um, learn about all these um, relationships that happened before. But again, the film doesn't deal again with the facts we know. Um, Jean-Jacques Mimouni is a nephew in this film, Jonathan Chayat, who lives in, in Montreal, follows the seven days of the Entebbe crisis telling you know every viewer what happened on those days so anybody who has never heard of Operation Entebbe will learn the facts again but the other part of the film is that in every one of these days he also finds out what happened to his uncle Jean-Jacques he never met him part of the reason Jean-Jacques went on that flight was to see him being born in Paris so he never met his uncle and 
um, people in the family always called him Jean-Jacques because he's, uh, he really looks like him. So he had this obsession with his uncle all his life. And he goes, it's like for him a journey to understand who his uncle was, what happened to him during the crisis, how did he die, why did the Israeli government tend to cover up his death, did it, you know, did it um, affect the myth, did they want the myth to, be, uh, to look a bit more clean. And this is something that has been interesting me in filmmaking forever. Before I did this film, I made a film about the classmates of Anna Frank. And also there, I was looking for the shadows behind the myth. Well, how do you build a myth? Not in the negative sense, in the positive sense. You want to build a myth, what facts do you leave out? That's part of the question we're going to deal with in this film. Did you cover the story in your film of Mrs. Dora Block? And was she murdered in the hospital, or did she die of choking on a chicken bone, or is that just a story and not the reality? My main character, Jonathan, went to meet Ilan Hartuv in Jerusalem, Dora Block's son, who was taken hostage together with her. It was a very, very interesting and emotional reunion, not reunion, meeting between you know, two people who lost their relatives in Entebbe, and Ilan Altuv tells him two things in the interview. Number one, yes, she choked on a piece of meat and was driven to hospital. And this is exactly why she was left there, because the soldiers couldn't know she was there. But, as a fact, she was murdered by Idi Amin's guerrillas um, as part of his rage against what Israel did. Um, she was killed, but Ilan Hautouf and his family managed to bring her corpse to Israel to be buried in Jerusalem. A few years later, I think four years later, it took four, three or four years to bring her corpse back. The most interesting thing in their meeting, by the way, is Jonathan looking in Ilan's eyes and telling him, listen, Entebbe for us was a tragedy. For my grandfather, Entebbe is the saddest day. What was it like for you? So Ilan says, look, I lost my mother, but at least I came back alive. And I think it was the right thing to do, Operation Entebbe. What had to be done, had to be done. Some people are taken down. It was my mother, but I live with it. And this is like um, an understanding Jonathan takes with him. And he, he comes to terms with it. Things like this can happen. The pain is that his grandfather always felt... He deserved to be told the truth. He deserved the truth. He could take it. His grandfather was a policeman for 30 years in Paris. He, he understood something happened during the operation. And he, um, he just wanted to be told the truth. Just tell me what happened to my son. And they tried to cover it up. They told him it was asthma. He got scared. So um, this is what happened. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Idi Amin, when his government was overthrown, spent the last years of his life in Saudi Arabia. Is, is that correct? Uh, well, I didn't go into that, but um, I, as far as I know, after he was toppled in 1979, if I'm wrong, he spent his last years in Saudi Arabia. I didn't go very deep into Idi Amin's biography, but uh, very, very... Um, non-stable personality. I mean, this guy would be, you know, going with this side this day, the next day with the other side, whoever, whoever you wished. He was quite unstable, quite unstable. So it wasn't a surprise. The world wasn't shocked that Idi Amin is collaborating with, um, with terrorists. So again, the theme of your film is to tell the untold stories that haven't been told so far, also, as would you say, a kind of trauma therapy for the people who needed to have those stories told about either themselves or their relatives? I don't believe films should be trauma therapies. I think films should evoke emotions and, 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 and cause an emotion to come up in the viewer. It's not a therapy. I think it's a justifiable uh, starting point for a film when, when something so famous as Operation Entebbe has an untold side, it justifies going deeper and looking at the shadows behind the myth. It's not a therapy, I would say it's more a journey, a research to find out um, what exactly happened 35 years later and why certain facts have come up and certain facts gone to the side. And I think we needed 35 years to evaluate that.
Yes. Well, I'm very glad that I could talk to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to the premiere of your film. Thank you. And I know when it's out publicly, our viewers are going to want to watch it. Are there any final comments you'd like to make? Well, it's going to be broadcasted next month on Channel One. And in, in Israel, Israel's in Israel, Channel Israel, Israel Channel One. And it was pre-sold to Canadian TV CBC. That's how the whole project started. So hopefully it will be broadcasted in Canada this year as well, on national on the Radio Canada TV. So that will be nice as well. Eyal, thank, thank you, you very much. And Hanukkah Sameach. And to all our viewers too. Thank you. Thanks.